in exchange for cutting her grass for free, she allowed me to use the lawnmower yes. to cut everybody. And actually, I just managed, oversaw the entire operation. I either apply to all these um, jobs with recruiters and hope that somebody calls me back or I can create that opportunity for myself. So basically, I was just a connector between recruiters and job seekers. It resulted in me finding an actual job that I was looking for. So I went around to all the small local businesses in the neighborhood and sold ad space on those screens for two years. And it was a great experience. Learned a lot from it as well. The major problems were carrying around my bags all day. My heavy laptop, I had my personal laptop, had my work laptop in it. Got tired of like not being able to enjoy, enjoy myself with having to watch my things. I would pay somebody to actually pick this stuff up for me and take this back to my house. Right. It came to me, I was like, everybody else has this problem as well. Researchers just walking through the streets of New York City, seeing people drag things behind them that they didn't want to drag. I'm so scared of somebody stealing an idea, I didn't know how to code, so what I did was I went to YouTube and Google. I found a, a, a basic tutorial on how to make a web app. I basically modeled this initial application as if it was a taco delivery uh, app. Basically, I'm in the last mile delivery service. If you say pick up at 10, drop off at noon, then the actual driver holds it in their trunk. More than two hours between the pickup and the drop off, then it actually routes to one of our uh, secure storage facilities. I did the first 100 rides um, within the app. Literally just put it onto the app store and wait it. Took like two days to get the first download of the app. Sure, um, the first usage. The first usage took about 20, I would say about 25 days. I had a t-shirt with the logo on it ah. as well. Literally asked people, did they want me to hold their bags while they went on a ferry ride? So that was actually before the app even started. Hey, I see you've been holding your bag for a long time. Um, I can hold this for you for 20 bucks while you go on this cruise. Um, I'm parked right here. Great thing about it is that uh, she booked it far in advance. You know, I, I'm a firm believer in having your customer tell you what they want. If I see an interesting email address, I definitely want to, um, I definitely want to talk to that person face to face. Not on Craigslist looking for Uber and, and Lyft drivers. At a meeting, at, a, at an office building to give them like an orientation. Are you insured? Yes. Uh, drove for Uber and Lyft in Jersey for, for a thousand rides and did those drives to try to understand how Uber and Lyft actually routed their drivers. Getting some workarounds to make it convenient for my drivers to be to work full time for Uber and Lyft yeah. as well as use my app to pick up bags. Drivers tell other drivers about it so they download it. it stays here in the island of Manhattan is $30. If it crosses a borough it's $50. If it goes to and from the airport it's $65. It's the market out and you see what they're willing to pay, right? and then you adjust accordingly. And we decided to uh, expand to San Francisco. I really needed the service in San Francisco because I missed my flight. I just had my bags meet me at the airport. I had a, my CTO just launched on Android as well three weeks ago. Moved over a thousand bags around uh, so, New York City. So that'll be beholden to some VC telling you that you need to be a, a rocket ship. The story of Lyft, don't have all the issues that Uber had as far as educating the masses, getting strangers in your car. Well, I can make decisions without having to go and run it up the flagpole to other people. Or to partner up with those co-working spaces that cater to the nomadic yep. entrepreneurs. I'm a firm believer in just going out and grinding. We added on a coat check piece. Anytime you bring technology to like a low technology space, you lose that number, then you're gonna have a hell of a time trying to get your coat back. Automate that coat check process. Just to check their coat, and instead of them getting a little piece of paper, all they did was gave the coat check attendee their phone number. You close it by uh, downloading the app on iOS and Android, My, My Bag Check. Welcome to Startup Hunter, also streaming on YouTube. We cover startups that have made it. We, I mean I, are making it or that have failed. I am here with Micah Lewis yes, yes. from My Bag Check, which is sort of like an app. It just is an app where you say, I have a bag I might have gotten off a plane. Here's my bag. I need somebody to hold it for a few hours while I go have a meeting. And that's what My Bag Check is. More or less right? Yes. Okay. Uber, Uber for your stuff. Uber for your stuff, love it. Even better than what I could do. So, on this show we take a look at the history of entrepreneurs. And Micah, we're gonna start all the way at the beginning with you. So, 
Where were you born and what did your parents do? Oh, great. Well, I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and one fun fact about Jacksonville, it's the 12th largest city in the United States and actually the largest city by land mass of all of the United States as well. Over one million people live there. Just FYI, small big town. Um, and my parents, my mom, uh, worked in the insurance industry for a little bit and retired from there and decided to go and get her PhD and now works as an administrator within the public school system. And um, that's by choice. Yes, by choice, by choice. There's a greater calling for everyone in life. Um, and that was her greater calling. Um, and then my dad worked as a longshoreman. Um, if you don't know what a longshoreman what is. What is a longshoreman? Oh. I know it has something to do with the shore, but. <laughs> yeah, so a longshoreman, like all of our supplies that come from other countries have to come into one of the major ports in the United States. One of those major ports is in Jacksonville. And when you think about like uh, these Mercedes or these, uh, you know, any supplies, these buses, they have to come from somewhere. So they're shipped from other countries. They come to the port and longshoremen offload those things uh, off the boats and, you know, to distribution centers. So that's what he does. Um, yeah, that's what my parents do. And uh, yeah, that's where I'm from. So what was the first entrepreneurial thing that you did? Okay. Did you sell lemonade? Did you have a paper route? No, the first thing that I did was uh, uh, went to my neighbor because we, we couldn't afford a lawnmower, basically. So I went to my neighbor who had a lawnmower and in exchange for cutting her grass for free, she allowed me to use the lawnmower yes. to cut everybody else's grass that for free. A, that is a key. Uh, so you work for negative income. You work, you work for free. Yep. In exchange, you got a lot more in return. Exactly, exactly. And one of the things about it, I used to gather the other kids around in the neighborhood as well too. And actually, I just managed, oversaw the entire operation. I didn't actually do the, <laughs> do the actual cutting myself. Wait a minute. So, <laughs> so, so tell me about this. Like, are you are you walking around in like a scooter or like a bicycle, just going going from lawn to lawn, like just like to, on a street corner, like? <laughs> well, well, you're actually saying on a scooter or a bike. No, I had these guys push it from neighborhood to neighborhood. Uh, through through the neighborhood for me, and I had uh, I had a rake. I mean, because we could afford a rake, so I had somebody who was raking the leaves as another guy cut the leaves. <laughs> and then you're just like the foreman. Yes, that's basically it. <laughs> Before I knew what a foreman now, was. How old were you? So I was probably like ten or eleven at it. the time. I love so, it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, that was the first. I mean, that was the first time I guess I stepped into. I didn't know what entrepreneurship was. You know, it was just more of hey, here's a way, I see a resource here, why not use this resource to make money? So uh, well, it's, an it's an unused resource, you know, it's just yes. sit a lawnmower is just sitting there not making money, and uh, so you found a way to, to utilize it and to uh, get, get something more out of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so moving on from lawnmowers, what was the next thing that you did? So the next thing I could think of, um, I kind of focused on like school and everything. Um, I was a little nerdy jock um, during high school. So the next major thing I can remember. Uh, a nerdy jock, what, 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 what sport? <laughs> so I played multiple sports. I ran cross country, basketball, football, played tennis, what, ran track. You know, you're not, you're not, you know, six, over six foot. Like I'm not six feet tall. So what position did you play? What, what position did you play? In basketball, I was a point guard. Right. You know, fast and could jump high. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it was really good too. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with a park right across the street from my house. So, um, so practice was nothing to just walk across the street and play ball. That's, I mean, that's what I did to stay out of trouble. In basketball, I would play wouldn't play a, a really defensive role. But what I would do is, since we're about the same height, yeah. and guys are much taller than us. I would stay like, you know, way, like pretty much near the half court okay. and just sort of like facilitate plays. Okay. But I was, you know, fast and like, uh, it was always very effective. Take, you know, take some threes once in a while. That's it. I mean, and again, growing up right across the street from a park enabled me to like hone my shot and everything. So I was a really good shooter, outside shooter. So uh, that's what I built my, my basketball game on and was a three pointer. Anyway, um, back to ner nerdy jocks. So you were saying the next thing that you sort of did in the entrepreneurial sense. Yeah. So uh, 
uh, when I, so I moved after, went off to college, um, UCF, uh, go Knights. UCF is? University of Central Florida. Oh, yeah. And um, after that, I moved to, moved to California. Um, and after California, I came back to Florida. And one of the issues that I had when I came back to Florida is that I had no professional uh, network because um, focused on school and college and everything. So, um, so one of the first real businesses, I, I guess you could say, was I started a business networking company. Um, and you're probably thinking, what's a business networking company? Um, so the issue that I had when I came back to Florida is that I did not, I needed to get a job. And so when, when getting that job, I could either apply to all these um, jobs with recruiters and hope that somebody calls me back or I can create that opportunity for myself. So what I did was I went to a few restaurants and said, hey, I can guarantee that 100 people are gonna come in here on a Wednesday. What are you gonna pay me in return for that? And they say, okay, if you can bring 100 people in here, we'll give you $500. There I go, you go, I go, great. So then at that point, I went and started contacting all recruiters. And I said, hey, are you looking for job seekers? What type of job seekers are you looking for? Oh, yeah. Restaurants and I... Yeah, how'd, I you, how'd you get this? Was it, were these college students? No, so what I did was, I mean, this was during the... The economy was tanking and everything oh, around 2010, you, 2011. Right. So okay. there were a lot of unemployed people. So I basically just uh, put out an ad on Craigslist. Anybody looking to find a job, come to this networking event at this particular restaurant. Right. And so basically I was just a connector between recruiters and job seekers um, and then got paid for it. Got so, it. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that was like my first entrepreneurial thing. I, I called it six degree networking. Um, and it was, uh, it was, a, it was a, pretty good, a pretty good success. I had a few events um, while I lived in Tampa and, uh, and yeah. And it, it resulted in me finding an actual job that I was looking for, so which what, was the original purpose. What job did you find? So I started working for a small tech company um, at that time. It was called TeamViewer. If anybody knows what TeamViewer is, it's a remote desktop software solution. Um, found a job as a, a, a salesperson, sales account executive. So, now were uh, you uh, flying around? No, was not. Um, but they did send me to Germany for a little while because they were headquartered in Germany. So that was that was a exciting time to be able to live in that culture and uh, and experience that for a little bit uh, on the company's dime and not my own dime. So uh, so yeah, and that kind of sparked my uh, my interest in travel at that Let's time. Let's get. By the way, it's like sub sub freezing so let's get some nice warm sun right here it's yes. fantastic yes so uh so yeah that's uh that was like my my real big foray into entrepreneurship and just and just seeing the power of connecting one group with another group of people moving forward what was the next thing that you did yeah so uh again living in tampa at the time and uh, I get, I'm really intrigued about un, unutilized resources. Right. And that was like my first foray into like seeing that truly happen. And I remember when I, when I lived in California, I remember we would go to this nice Chinese restaurant and at that Chinese restaurant, they had these big television screens up there, a long line out the door and around the corner. Uh -huh. And uh, with these big television screens, they ran ads on those screens, like towards the bottom, like in an RSS feed. And now that I was back in Florida, in Tampa, I realized, I was like, okay, here's, here's an opportunity to, um, to literally uh, monetize a market, because I saw no one else doing that. And what I did was, I went again to these restaurants, bars, lounges, where people congregate at, doctor's offices, dentist's offices, um, and I convinced them to allow me to put a television screen and utilize their power and Wi-Fi. And what I did uh, on top of that was put a small computer on the back of the on the back of the television screen um, that I that I can control that I can control and uh, uh, via my via the Team Viewer application, which is a remote desktop software. And then I went around to all the small local businesses in the neighborhood and sold ad space on those screens. So you basically created an advertising network. Yeah. Now how'd you get the screens? I went to eBay. Oh, so you just bought cheap, you just bought cheap yeah. screens. I just bought Vizio 32. Now, 48 there, was inch there screens. any um, competition for that? Not in Tampa at the time. Yeah, no one was doing. This was around 2011, 2012. 
No one was doing indoor in digital in, advertising. In Tampa. Yes, yes. Um, so I think you, you, you benefited you benefited from the fact that um, there probably were companies in New York and you know LA you're, you're doing right. that, yep. but they hadn't made forays into Tampa. That is correct. So you made your uh, homegrown solution, and yep. uh, you had success doing that. Yes. So, yes. Um, did you become a millionaire off of that? And uh, <laughs> you know, what was? How did that sort of come to an end? Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't necessarily a millionaire. It definitely wasn't even a thousandaire. If that's even a word, so uh, it's a word. It's so, a word. So yeah, but one interesting takeaway from that is, is that uh, SeaWorld actually reached out to me, found me some type of way on the internet, and asked me to outfit Adventure Island in Tampa with television screens. And here's one lesson that I did learn from there, from that, is that you can't sell yourself short. Even when you get opportunities like that, when somebody calls you up, understand your value. Um, the lesson that I learned from that is that they gave me a tour of the facilities and was telling me like, hey, how can you outfit this or what, are you, what is your solution for this? Uh -huh. And I'm thinking I'm like all professional with like a notepad writing down, but I'm like literally like a kid in a candy store in my head, like freaking out that I'm even having this opportunity to right. talk to these people. Right. Th um, you're like, way, I'm way out yeah, of my league here. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so one mistake that I did, I quoted them like $10,000 to outfit everything. That's way too little. <laughs> exactly. So obviously you could have said you could have said ten million. They wouldn't have even blinked. <laughs> exactly. So one of these things where I learned from that. Obviously, I didn't get the contract. Um, you probably asked for too little, and that, that right there gave him a signal. Exactly. Exactly. And it's one of these things where I know not to do that ever again. Um, and do your do your research. That's what I learned from it, because I definitely didn't do research to see what the market value of what I was providing. Uh, you got to know your customer. Um, you know, sometimes the exact same product for you know somebody you know really well, and you know they're like, you know they can't afford. You know, this, you'll probably charge the same thing to like a few special cases um, that you would to uh, versus a different price that you would to somebody who you know who can pay for it. Correct. Correct. I mean, it's it was a lesson learned, and I. I that was a valuable lesson to learn at that point. Um, shortly after that, um, I kind of shut down the business. I basically just sold the equipment to the to the establishments where the screens were in. Um, definitely. Now, what about what about you could have you could have made a sale right there of the company for for a multiple. You know, you could have found found somebody and been like, hey, I have this advertising network. Do you want to run it? You're right. You're right. Again, being uh, being. Being a guy that didn't know what I was doing, didn't truly see the value in it. Yeah. I mean, it was a it was a project for me. Right. Um, wasn't really something that I was like, hey, let's take this from you know point A to point B to point C. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I basically just broke even on the equipment that I had well, there. Well, that's that's still fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, that was did that for two years and it was a great experience. Learned a lot from it as well. Yeah. I never did anything like that. So what was the next thing? So, uh, and all doing this while, I was working in corporate America at that time. Um, so about four years ago, I got the opportunity to uh, come up here to this great city, New York, that we're, that we're walking through as of now. Um, I was working for, uh, for a big company as an outside sales uh, consultant. So what that meant was I was traveling to clients either via car, um, bus, subway, um, every day because um, my job was to be out on the streets talking to these clients um, and during that time frame I saw there was a major problem one of those major problems was carrying around my bags all day a heavy laptop I had my personal laptop had my work laptop in it and any other things that I needed during the day such as my gym bag and so uh, and so yeah one day after work I was walking with my laptop bag pretty heavy Stopped off at a shoe store in Union Square to buy a pair of shoes. And then a friend calls me up and says, hey, let's go grab a drink. Right. And I go, all right. So we go to the East Village at a bar. I shove my stuff up under the bar to try to keep an eye on it. And just got tired of like not being able to enjoy, enjoy myself with having to watch my things. And so I, I, I told him, I was like, hey, I'm going to run home really quick. 
drop the stuff off, then meet you back out at the next bar. And anytime you, you do that, you never actually come back out. So with, uh, so with that being said, so with that being said, I'm walking back towards the train and I'm thinking to myself, I would pay somebody to actually pick this stuff up for me and take this back to my house. Right. People in New York don't have cars. Um, they tend to use Ubers more than they tend to uh, own cars. And, right. and I definitely am that case. And there are times when you have s stuff. There's, there are lots of times when I just go back to my house literally to drop off stuff. Yeah. Um, and think so, how much time is wasted when you do oh, that. Bit, like, it's like two and a half hours. Exactly. And that's, that's like, that's a lot of time, you know, in the middle of the day when business should be happening or whatever, whatever, you know, whatever important should be happening. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so you're thinking I, I, I'd like to pay somebody to hold my bag. Yep. Uh, so uh, go on. Yeah. So uh, as I'm walking back, I, I mean, literally epiphany moment, eureka moment, whatever you want to call it, goal strike, you know, it was like, this makes sense. And literally uh, and <laughs> the clouds opened up and a vision came to me. <laughs> um, I started looking around. Did, did, the sea, did the sea part? The sea did part. A sea of people walking through New York City parted for me, you know, and I actually think I was floating on like cloud nine yeah. at the time. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, you know, the idea came to me. I was like, everybody else has this problem as well. And one thing I want to say with that is that usually when people start an idea or a business, they do all this customer validation or try to see if there's product market fit. My research was just walking through the streets of New York City, seeing people drag things behind them that they didn't want to drag. Uh -huh. If it's seven o'clock at night, there should be no reason why you have your yoga mat on your shoulder. You know, saw a guy on the train with a with a rubber tree. Like, do you really want to drag this rubber tree through through the through the subway system? So, uh, so yeah, that was the idea it came from, and um, I was so I, I knew it was such a great idea, and I'm not being like egotistical, but I knew it was such a great idea, and I couldn't believe somebody else hadn't thought about it. I was so scared of somebody stealing the idea. I didn't know how to code, so what I did was I went to YouTube and Google, and found. I found a, a, a basic tutorial on how to make a web app. And I spent nine months teaching myself Fantastic. how to make an app. Fantastic. So, yes. And in doing so, you know, lots of founders, um, some founders pay people, some founders uh, do it your way, which is just do it yourself. And yeah. I think in doing so, you start to understand if you're getting ripped off by a developer. Yes. Or, yes. You know, if they're, if they, that's as simple as that. And uh, you can get ripped off in, a, in any industry. I just remember there was this great thing on Shark Tank where, where the, they were like, yo, we spent $3 million on development. Oh. And they're like, they saw you coming from a mile away. Yes. Just because yes. you spent $3 million in development uh, doesn't mean you're entitled to anything. Exactly. Especially if there's zero revenue. Exactly. Anyway, I'm really salty this morning. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry to take the, 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 the no, thunder from no. you. No, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, there's there's other stories of founders that I know of the same thing, where some developer goes in there and charges them some ridiculous amount of money um, to do something simple, as uh, make a landing page or something to exactly. collect emails. Exactly. It's ridiculous. So um, you know, I definitely didn't want. I definitely didn't want to to be in that position. So that's why I kind of made the, the bear, the backbone and the framework of the app myself. Um, and uh, once I completed it, I didn't know how to get it onto the app store. So at that point, I did actually, I did actually employ, uh, employ a developer to, uh, to do that for me. Well, get, literally getting it on the app store is uh, like a click. Yeah, it is. But <laughs> um, talking to somebody who's non-technical, it's more than just a click, you right. know? Because um, especially this, this platform that I used, you had to do some extra work before you can get to that first click yeah. to put onto the App Store. So, uh, so yeah, so I employed, I basically went to Craigslist again. Craigslist was my friend in creating this business and threw out an ad asking for anyone who, uh, who, uh, who knew iOS 
and um, I gave him like some general specs on it. Hey, this project now, is ninety five percent complete. <clears throat> that that initial job, he shouldn't have charged you any more than a few hundred bucks. I mean, at the you know at the literally the literally just if all he was doing is putting an app on the app store. Correct. Now. Did he get you for more than that? Well, I mean, he did do a little bit more than that. So, I mean, just to give a little bit more background on the app itself, like, I basically modeled this initial application as if it was a taco delivery uh, app. Um, and the intricacies of this app that I run is that there's a lot more things that happen on the back end. So, uh, yes, to answer your question, he did charge me more than that, but I saw the value in it. And I took in a few, coming from a sales background, I know how to take in RFPs, evaluate them, and then choose the best, choose the best, uh, the best person for the job. So uh -huh. I was really happy with the work that they did and the support that they gave me in the first uh, in the first few months that the app was app was up and running. All right, we're not even to up and yeah. running yet. Um, all right, so so you do an app, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now talk about you know. How are you getting people to hold other people's backs? Are you doing the bag holding initially at first? Yeah, so um, so here's the great thing about this app is that uh, basically I'm in the last mile delivery service. And it's uh, a lot of people on the outside make it seem like it's so complicated. It's not that complicated. Um, so what we do and how we built it is that the driver actually holds the bag in their trunk if the pickup and delivery was in two hours. So for example, if you say pick up at 10, drop off at noon, then the actual driver holds it in their trunk. Um, if, you, if it's more than that, if it's more than two hours between the pickup and the drop off, then it actually routes to one of our uh, secure storage facilities. All right, all right. You're, 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 at, you're answering a different question. Okay. When you were first launching the app, okay, were you personally holding these bags? Uh, I was never personally holding them at my apartment or anything. I would I would pick them up and then route them to my storage facility that I had. And uh, was it just you at first, like doing it, or did you? Oh yes, yes. I mean that's most important is to is to uh, put a face to your customer. Um, as well as, as well as, you know, thank them for, you know, having the, having the confidence and entrusting you with their, with their belongings. So yes, I was the first person. I did the first 100 rides um, within the app. Okay, so you launch it. Do you just, do you have a network on Facebook of friends and, and of friends that you just sort of like put it out to them? <laughs> no, didn't do any of that. I literally just put it onto the app store and wait it. Yeah, that's it. So how long did it take for your first? <laughs> so from the first, so there's two part questions. So from when it first went on, the first person to download it took like two days to get the first download of the app. Sure, um, the first usage. The first usage took about 20, I would say about 25 days. Now, here's but, the th was, was your app localized only to New York City? Yes, yes. Got it, so it's not like, Hey, there's a delivery in Los Angeles. No. All right. No. But one thing I do want to add to that before then to kind of like, before the app was fully released, what I did was I actually went down to Battery Park, down where the, the ferries come in and out. And I parked my car in one of the garages there and literally asked people, did they want me to hold their bags while they went on a ferry ride? So that was actually before the app even started. Right. Which is great validate. Well, that's like, okay. Let me uh, let me let me just be devil's advocate. I'm sure most of them said, uh, "Are you crazy?" Do you, like most of them w were thinking, "Like who's this guy who wants to steal my bag?" Right? <laughs> no, no, that's definitely not. When you're thinking about lugging your things to New York City, you're happy that somebody wants to. Yeah, but pull you're your an unknown. You. You're an unknown person. Like, why would they trust him? Like, I'm just telling you. If somebody yeah. said, "I'm gonna hold your bag," I'm like, I would literally be like you know, calling the police or something. Yeah. So here's the reason, here's one way you can make yourself look a little bit more official. I had a t-shirt with the logo on it ah. as well. So it made it seem a little bit more official. Like I was this big operation and this was the normal thing to do. Right. Um, and that's another reason why I chose like Battery Park area. Being a part, there's a lot of tourists down there. Okay, so, okay, so that paints a different picture for me. So you have this t-shirt, what is it, My Bag Check? Yep. 
and give me your sales pitch like <laughs> to these people. Hey, I see you've been holding your bag for a long time. Um, I can hold this for you for 20 bucks while you go on this cruise. Um, I'm parked right here. Here's a, here's a picture of my license plate. So I'm not going anywhere. Uh, Want to pay me 20 bucks? All right. So how many people uh, did this? So I would get on average about five to seven per weekend. I would do it on the weekends. Right. So, uh, so yeah, about five to seven people. So I was making uh, about a hundred bucks a day. Right. Which is not great money, but it's still a validation of, of your concept. Correct. Correct. So, and I, I really like that actually. Um, too many people code up an app for eight months and they don't validate at all. Like, they, so, so basically they're, they end up, just like the Shark Tank example, they end up with, you know, a $3 million solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Exactly. So you got some, some confidence building right there. And um, so, so, so we're, we're trying to avoid poop here. And uh, you got some confidence building right there. So, you, and then we, I guess we were talking about launching your app, like, you, yeah, you so, said you didn't go right to, oh yeah, right, you, you put it on the app store. Yeah, so I put it on the app store and- It took uh, 28 days. Yeah, it took about, it took about uh, 28 days before the first customer actually uh, paid me through the app and through the entire setup. All right, so, so you get a, a notification, are you like at work? And I'm like, oh, I gotta go to the doctor. <laughs> no, no, the great thing about it is that uh, she booked it far in advance. So, oh, okay. So, so it so gave me time to prepare for it, yeah. It yeah. wasn't one of these like, I need you here now. Yeah, correct, it was not. <laughs> and I remember the story, I remember the story, like she was, uh, she was coming in, she was coming in and she was gonna be going to school and she needed a place to hold her bags for like five days. And five days? Uh, yeah, so five days. Now, so, I, I'm just thinking like, is that outside of your business model these days for a five day hold? Um, not necessarily. Yeah. Not necessarily. There's some people that come into New York City that are, are doing like a cross country tour yeah. and don't want to lug their things, you know, to Miami, to San Francisco. I hadn't even, I hadn't even thought of that. I was thinking, that it's mostly just like an hour or two. So there's all kinds, so interest, very interesting. Um, so you did a five day hold for her. Yes, yes. So I remember picking it up from the, the airport and she had her mom and another family member there and uh, dropping it off in um, some place in Brooklyn for yeah. five days later. So, uh, so yeah, it was the first person who actually- And did you wear the t-shirt? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, and I gave them a business card at that point in time as well. Love it. So, uh, so yeah. So, um, how did it sort of progress from there? And when, when, was your first, when was your launch date? So, the launch date was November 2017. So, like t t one and a half years ago. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been growing ever since. Um, I never did any advertising for wow. it. Uh, just wanted to wanted to spend this time uh, to truly understand like the usage cases for it. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a firm believer in having your customer tell you what they want. Of course. Um, and then taking that information and then uh, and innovating from there. So um, that's the approach I've taken with the company, and and it's pretty some pretty interesting things that have happened um, <laughs> over the last 15, 16 months. So what I want to know is scale. Mm -hmm. um, who, who was the first? What was the first time that you stopped doing uh, these these holdings yourself, and who did you bring on, and how did you bring them on? Yeah, so um, so just so you know, I still do um, some of the holdings myself, and, and the reason or why. Or the back checks. Yes, and the reason why is being in part because uh, I see if I see an interesting email address, I definitely want to. Um, I definitely want to talk to that person face to face um, and try to understand like how they found me, how, why they use me. Um, so yeah, I still every so often do uh, do the pickups and, and holding myself. Sure, but, but the, uh, the question was like, yeah, who was the first person that you um, went to to like, you know, outside of yourself? Yeah, so again, went back to Craigslist. Um, yeah. Went back to Craigslist, put an ad on Craigslist looking for Uber and Uber and uh, 
and Lyft drivers. Right. And had probably about 50 people download uh, download the app from that Craigslist ad. Um, had a meeting at a, at an office building to give them like an orientation and everything about it. Um, right. So you and, you set up like a little. Like I was you a literally group interview. a group was, interview basically. I was literally yesterday at like the Uber Mecca in New York City with uh-huh. there's insurance companies, there's rental companies, there's Lyft, Uber, Via all in one building. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? Yeah. Long, Long Island City. Yep. So you yep. set up like your mini version of that. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's exactly what I did. Um, another thing that I did as well. Wait, question. Sure. Really basic question. Are you insured? Yes. Yes. Good. So uh, if, if, there was, if that wasn't the answer, like, yes, uh, we would have to have a talk. No, that was one of the things that I needed to needed to do before I could even like uh, start start operating, basically. You know, well, I mean, there's nothing really technically blocking you from from pr- practicing free enterprise. I just don't think it's wise. Correct. Correct. I don't want the liability on it. No. no uh, good. Yes. So. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's basically how I got my first drivers. Um, and I also. Uh, I also went and uh, drove for Uber and Lyft in Jersey for for a thousand rides. Yeah. Because uh, one thing I learned is that uh, I started pitching this, and people weren't really they're like, "What do you know about anything about Uber and Lyft?" Okay. So uh, so I, I was like, "You're right." So I went out. So what was the what was the complaints you know specifically? So uh, besides uh, besides that they're just driving you and like trying to like. Well, here's what it is. Everybody tries to make it seem like last mile delivery is so complicated. It's not that complicated. They'll throw things like they'll throw things like UPS and FedEx have been trying to do this for the past 50 years and they haven't figured it out. It's because they're too big. They're not nimble enough and nobody's sitting there trying to innovate on something. And so uh, and so to prove these people wrong, I went out and did those drives to try to understand how Uber and Lyft actually routed their drivers. Yeah. And through that, I gained so many different insights. One is, it kind of, it also validated the problem that I know already existed by doing, you know, one-on-one interviews with my my riders. And then two, um, I was able to to find some some hacks around the Uber and and Lyft app. Not hacking their actual software, but, uh, but finding some workarounds to make it convenient for my drivers to be to work full time for Uber and Lyft, yeah. as well as use my app to pick up bags and everything. So, uh, so yeah, it's pretty interesting. So, so you have your orientation meeting, yes, with the drivers, and uh, it reminds you only one person showed up. So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> so, so talk about like the company coming to to, to you know a scale. Um, and uh... yeah, so as far as uh, again, no no type of advertising. People literally, I write blogs on my my website. People find me via those blogs, and literally, it's a it's a network effect uh, to a certain extent. Um, drivers tell other drivers about it, so they download it. Um, you know, people find it in other countries as well as other cities, and then. So, when was the first time you, you went beyond New York? So that recently just happened within the last, uh, I'd say, three weeks. And and, uh, and why, why did you wait so long? Because, uh, for one, with with New York City and you know the 15 million plus people that live here in yeah. this area, you really don't need to leave New York. Um, you have you can you can build a business right here in New York City and make a lot of money off of it. Um, sure, one but of those, you have a scalable business model. That is true. That is true. So um, what I did was, and, and the reason why I waited so long, because I wanted to understand the logistics here in New York City. There's no other city in the world that has complicated logistics like Manhattan. Absolutely. And and meaning by that, from a price point perspective, you know, because a lot of people speak about the price point. Um, oh yeah. Here, how much does it cost? So if, if, your, if your bag stays in, it's a flat fee. If your bag stays here in the island of Manhattan, it's $30. If it crosses a borough, it's $50. If it goes to and from the airport, it's $65. Now, what about these multi-day situations? And then we charge $5 per day for oh, storage. that's very reasonable. Yes, yes. It's, like, that's it's prob- a no-brainer. It's probably underpriced. It is. It is, actually. But it's one of these things where you test the market out, and you see what they're willing to pay, Right. and then you adjust accordingly. 
So, uh, so yeah, and then we decided to uh, expand to San Francisco. And the reason why San Francisco was the next place. Because um, uh, Uber's there. <laughs> well, that, that and um, San Francisco, I used to live in the Bay Area in Oakland. And uh, I remember about two years ago, well, a year and a half ago, I had, the, I had just launched the app and I was out there for a conference. And I really needed the service in San Francisco because I missed my flight. I was at a conference. I left my uh, I left my uh, my bag at um, at the conference center, broke my phone, and had to run to Union Square in San Francisco to get a new phone. Got my new iPhone, tried to run back to the conference to pick up my bag before my flight left, and I literally missed my flight because of traffic going back and forth through San Francisco. And I thought, you know, they need it here as well too. I don't want anybody else to be in the same situation I am, running around trying to chase their bags. And if I did have the service out there, I could have just had my bags meet me at the airport as I as I uh, so, as I came back. So, so talk so. about rolling it out in San Francisco. I mean, how's it any different? Um, is it like do you, do you need somebody on the ground, or is it just like like it's, it's a scalable business model? Yeah. Like, yeah. Is it just like basically uh, s some code you need to adjust and that's about it? That's literally it. It's code that you need to adjust, throw out an ad on Craigslist that you need some Uber and Lyft drivers, and uh, that's it, Yeah, essentially. And just understanding the pricing, the dynamic pricing in San Francisco. And what I mean by that is, what's the, what's the value of going from like the Tenderloin to uh, SFO? Or what's the value of going from, you know, Cobble Hill to uh, Embarcadero. So just understanding the pricing surrounding that, that's it. A few lines of code, throw out a Craigslist ad, and then uh, and then understand what the pricing looks like. So how's that there. going? We're still testing it out. Um, we're still testing it out in there to see, to see, work out a few kinks, but um, but yeah, it's going. It's going is the best, is the best answer I have for you. <laughs> so you just rolled that out three weeks ago? Yes. That's your and that's the first city you've ever done outside of New York. That is correct. That is correct. Talk about your team. Is it just you? Um, so up until about five months ago, it was just me. Okay. And um, while out in San Francisco, missing that flight, um, I, I met, uh, met a, my CTO. Um, I brought my CTO on to kind of handle the technical. Now, are you iOS only? or? No, we just launched on Android as well three weeks ago when we rolled out San Francisco. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we're Android, we're uh, we're iOS, and we have a web application as well too. In case you're, in case you don't want to use a mobile app to book the service, your your numbers, if you, if you if you if you're open to that, um, you know, like I'll give you I'll give you some broad numbers. So uh, number of users, number of transactions, is it is it growing? Yeah, yeah, it's most definitely growing. Um, so we've had about 2,000 plus downloads um, on iOS, and like I said, we just released uh, Android, so I hadn't even taken a look at how many downloads on Android. Um, and in that time frame, we've moved over 1,000 bags around uh, so, New York City. So that's pretty huge. So you've moved 1,000 bags and only 2,000 downloads. It's like, it's, it's insane. That means like most of the people who are downloading it are using it. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Have you and you said you haven't done any paid advertising? That is correct. Are you so the solution to me is just like what happens if you pour some gasoline on this fire? That's <laughs> it'll go gangbusters. So uh, so why haven't you done it? So so here's one thing: I bootstrapped the company myself. Uh, of course, no, I mean so, that's what uh, I'm getting at. So uh, so yeah, and then again, I think it's I think it's pretty cool. Um, in this point to just take a look at it and see how it organically grows. Um, I think so you're just you know, being real patient. Yeah. I mean, it's one of these things where do you want to be beholden to some VC telling you that you need to be a, a rocket ship or do you want to grow it on your own terms? Well, there's a thing which is go viral or die. So what's to stop somebody else from just copying you that wants to take VC money mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I think there's still oh, more power to them. Because one of the biggest things, one of the biggest uh, struggles that I have by being so far advanced in this I idea and business is that I have to educate the market on the service on this, on this service that has to do it. Correct. So if someone else wants to take that mantle and do that and spend their money on it, then great. Right. Because that, that actually helps you in some in some way. 
yeah it helps you but it's it's always good to like be the market educator and the sol like to be able to say here's the problem and i have the solution it's always you know but is that but is that and just to use a correlation well, on that good point uh, uh, use a correlation on that look at uber and lyft lyft just went ipo'd before uber did uh-huh and lyft is only here in the united states Oh, so, yeah. so when you look at the story of Lyft, you don't have all the issues that Uber had as far as educating the masses, getting strangers in your cars well, and everything. It goes to this, this thing, last, last mover advantage. Yeah. Which yeah. is, you know, uh, sort of wise. So very, very touche, very, very good. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's why it's, it's great to, to do this and, and, and the speed that I'm at, or I'm not beholden to anyone else. Let's get into the sun, yes. shall we? I can make I can make decisions without having to go and run it up the flagpole to other people saying, hey, can I do this? Or what should we spend our money on on this? My firm belief is, is that if you put a great product out there, then people will use you. If you provide the customer service and you know who your customers are, then you don't have anything to worry about. And so that came... That came from my experience in, in selling B2B software, you know, for the past 15 years. Um, so you did say you had an advisor? Yes. Now, does he have a little piece of the company? No. So it's just an informal advisor? Correct, correct. So, uh, do you, do, so what's your advisor telling you to do? So it's more of... Uh, and by the way, this advisor is some kind of MIT guy. I don't know if you want to name the name, but <laughs> you don't have to. You don't no, to. no. Um, but he's some kind of MIT guy, like seems to be reasonably successful. And yeah. <laughs> so what's he telling you to do? Well, and that's the great thing about it. He's not telling me to do anything. So the way our relationship works is I go to him. I have questions about the business. I have questions about, you know, relationships or questions about uh, business partnerships I, sit, I should make. And I literally just come with him with those questions and see what his, uh, his thoughts are. Um, but at, ultimately, at the end of the day, I make the decision. So, sure. uh, so yeah, it's more of just being a sounding board Yo, uh, very than anything it's, else. It's very valuable when you're a, a solo, I mean, not really a solopreneur, but just to have another uh, piece of business, good, yeah. look, good. He just avoided dog poop. <laughs> just to have somebody to bounce business, because a CTO is this executor, more or less. I don't, yes. mean, to, I don't mean to take away from you. I did, did that for a long time. Yes. And, uh, but to have somebody you know, to give you some business uh, sounding is, 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 is always good. Yes, and, uh, uh, and, that's, and that's literally what his role is within, the, within you know, my company. So, I think, it's, so. I think it's really wise, actually, that you're aware that educating the market is expensive. Um, right. And that maybe <laughs> it's, it's not the wisest idea uh, to go bankrupt yourself to educate the market or to go uh, take on, and I'm actually a big fan um, with you. On, on the whole VC thing, back it, they're like a backseat driver. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know who was really speaking about it well is uh, Chamath, the uh, CEO, uh, the owner of the Golden State Warriors. Okay. He was an old Facebook guy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's a VC, and he's he's literally like shitting on VCs. You know, it's just like all VCs want is uh, is, is, is is like returns and at all costs. And they could care less whether it's a, a long-term business. And, and I've had a few conversations with VCs as well, too. And one bit of advice that I know me and a lot of founders share is that, so a few of the VCs that I met with says, hey, you're too young for me. Like, your I'll, company's too young. Right. And they go, come back to me when you're doing 50K, 75K MRR. Sure. And okay. literally the quote that I told them, I said, if I'm doing 50 to 75K in MRR, with this monthly reoccurring revenue, um, I don't need you at that time. And they go, yeah, you don't. So I'm like, why are we even having this conversation right now? And it's well, literally well, a waste of time. Well, I, I don't know about that, but there, there's just this you know, thing which is, there's a certain point where you, you sort of need to put some gasoline on the fire. I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, the, the look from it is, there, there is a time that you put gasoline on the fire, but, but is that is that 88 octane or is that 93 octane? Yeah. You know. Well, I think and having the right VC is absolutely is 100% key. Correct. Correct. 
and having somebody that's that's going to be in it with you to help you grow and not just look into 10x their investment within the next you know five ten years but truly going to be strategic investment i think that's the best investment to look for is the strategic one rather than you know hey here's my money what stats are you giving me today? What stats are you giving me tomorrow? What are your KPIs? Right, and, like and, then they, and, then, and then if you're not aligned on the vision of the company... Then you're voted off your own well, company. Well, you, you risk that. <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, a lot of kids that I meet, you know, they're always like, yeah, I'm going to go get it. How do I get investment? I need to get investment. Like, yeah. investment. Like, that's the first thing that... Exactly. When you say startup, they think funding yep and what they're not really aware of is you know backseat driving and um what chamath was talking about which is you know vc just wants to return and he doesn't really care because he has a pool of you know 50 entrepreneurs and as yep. long as he gets a return on one of them yep. uh you know he's good so he'll he'll just drive you yeah no i it's 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 what they do um and i feel it's more like like the story the story usually goes that, hey, I have a startup now, I have an idea, give me money, let me go out and buy my customers. Well, that's just, you know, when you, oh, that's so lame. It's yeah. unbelievably lame. But, but you think about it like this, like, look at companies, any anytime we get on the subway here in New York City, all the startups that are advertising on the, on the subway system, you know, I'm not going to name them out. You can be here in New York and drive on any subway car and see all these startups yeah, and their advertisements. They're, and it's like... They're shiny. Yeah. And that's it. And it's all with that VC money that they have to say, hey, look at the customers that we had. Look at the customers. But I feel like if you build, if you solve a problem and build a business, then it will come eventually. Whether that's 12 months, whether that's 24 months, whether that's 48 months. You know, if you build a business and it's a solid business and it solves a problem, then the money will come. And, you know, I'm starting to see, I believe in this, I'm starting to see a lot of those things sprout up about all the little seeds that I planted, you know, in the first few months of running this business, all the business partnerships that I, that I was seeking out, that I saw how to strategically grow this. Now those things are so talk are about some of these business partnerships. <laughs> sure. So, uh, so for example, um, one of the strategies that I, that I thought to look at is, is looking at where people are actually holding bags. I mean, people are actually like with their bags. A lot of these co-working spaces around New York City. So, for example, you have uh, WeWork, you have Live Primary, you have Lyft all Primary? Live, Live, L I V E. What's, what's Live Primary? So, it's uh, one of the executives from uh, from WeWork actually branched off and started her own. We We Live. Yes. So no, uh, no, 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 no. Live Primary, not I, We Live. I know. But yeah. No, but I. But that's yeah. how I think of it, which is it's it's We Live because yeah. it's it's. What is it like? Because rent here is absurd. Yes. And yes. Branding play for cheap rent. Yeah. For for and, and for that cheap rent, you don't get a lot of space. That is true. <laughs> so, so so yeah. I mean, there's all these partnerships such as these co-working uh, companies that are out here that are that are catering to the freelancers, the entrepreneurs that don't want to be beholden to one specified desk space. But want to have the freedom to roam from like space to space. Well, you can't really and do so, that. You can't roam from space to space at WeWork. You, you can actually. Has you a, can. There's a hot desk, but there's a better competitor that I like better. It's called Spacious. Yes, Spacious is one. And I like Spacious because you pay, I don't remember, was it 200 bucks a month? And then you Correct. just get access to all 20 of their spaces. Yep. And I like that mo that bit from a business model, I like it a lot better uh, as opposed to WeWork, which is um, three, four, five hundred a month. And then if, if you, you have to pay $50 a day if you want a hot desk. Yeah. So, so $50 a day times 30 days is $1,500 to get access to all your space. Correct. So I just like Spacious as, you know, I, I like that a lot better. I'd, I'd rather yeah. pay 200 bucks a month than, mm -hmm. and have access to 20 spaces than 1500 a month plus the extra 200 for the membership. So two grand a month yeah. to get access to all the WeWork. So, yeah. so, sorry, WeWork, but uh, um, Spacious, you know, is right on that. Well, I mean, and, and then when you mention Spacious, there's a, other companies like Desk Pass, there's also Kettle Space. Um, but the thought is, is that you have a lot of these people that are working out of different locations that are going to be traversing the city. So it would only make sense for to partner up with those co-working spaces that cater to the nomadic yep. entrepreneurs. 
because they need to move from place to place and don't want to carry their bags. So doing something like that where you're calling on these people and you're saying, hey, here's a benefit I can add to your community. Yeah, like a and business, they see, to business to business package. Yes, let's do a revenue share where I give you, you know, I give your members a discount and every time your members use it, I give you a cut of that. Sure, sure. And so, it's a win-win. Yeah, that makes sense. So growing that and, and, and talk, having those conversations early on and, and, and forming those relationships is what really helps. It proves the model as well as it gives you that revenue without you having to go out and pound on doors and without you having to go out and spend tons of money on Google AdWords hoping that somebody downloads your app. Yeah, I mean, if you can uh, get validation in terms of business to business customers, you know, then hopefully you, you get some free advertising Correct. Uh, plus revenue. So that's like a, it's like a quadruple win right there. Correct. And it, I, it, I think that's one of the things that you, you don't have any of these deals uh, solidified at the moment, right? Not formally, but informally. Yes. All right. We'll, we'll leave it at that for now. Yes. <laughs> no. Yes. Or is there a, a space that you can announce? And, no, you, you can't formally announce the space. Correct. But can, uh, can you can you give a little hint? <laughs> oh, let's just say, uh, let's just say uh, there is a space that has the most co-working the most people. Co-working. Co-working the, the individuals. Behemoth, the behemoth of the co-working spaces. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's partnerships like that where you go in and you talk to different individuals um, that could really help you grow your business um, from a revenue share perspective. Yep. And I think that's, I think that's a... Sorry, it's so quiet and warm. Yes, yes it is. This is nice right here. We're currently in uh, West Village. I think we are, yes. Uh, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, it is, it is. But yeah, I mean, business partnerships like that I think are important to, uh, for, for companies to grow rather than going out saying, hey, here's, I need $100,000 in my marketing budget to, to do X rather than just going out and and, and, and grinding and that's and that's what I that's what I'm a firm believer in just going out and grinding so do you do you think uh, do you think your business model is solid or do you think you need to be uh, do you need a pivot like, um, do you need to be open to other ways to to utilize your app so uh, so it's funny that you asked that question um, because I don't believe in the word pivot and what I mean by pivot is I you know, I've, I've had this conversation with a few other angel investors, my CTO as well. Um, so one other thing that we added on, which I feel is another product line that feeds into it, is that we added on a coat check piece on the back end of our, the back end of our, our software. So how, what, what, does, does your coat mm -hmm. just end up in an Uber uh, driver's uh, trunk? It could. Okay. And so here's the, here's the interesting thing about it. What we saw, what we saw um, in the market is that technology, anytime you bring technology to like uh, uh, a low technology space, and what I mean by that is, is that when you think you go to a hotel, go to a bar, you go to a restaurant here in New York City, and they say, hey, can I hold your coat for you? In return, they give you this little piece of paper that has a number on it that you're supposed to guard with your life. Because if you lose that number, then you're gonna have a hell of a time trying to get your coat back. Okay. So what we did was, we built a frictionless uh, process on the back end of our bag check system to actually uh, to actually automate that uh, that that coat check process. So, so I mean, now, what's the like? What's the difference between a coat and a bag? I mean, they're they're a thing exactly. that, that you want to check. Exactly. So 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 what like where are the where are these coat checks happening? Like, cause so they they happen at events. Give me an example. So for example, uh, the behemoth co-working space we uh, we deployed our software there for one of their events there it's a hundred person event everybody who came in asked to check their coat and instead of them getting a little piece of paper all they did was gave the coat check attendee their phone number when they gave them their phone number the coat check attendee typed it into their their mobile phone took a picture of their items and it sent the text back to the person who was checking in is that too complicated it's not it's not because here's the thing about it. What's too complicated is that keeping up with that piece of ticket. What's also too complicated for the, the person who's checking the bag is that your item that's left at the end of the night 
whose item is this? The only way I can identify you is this four, five, six, seven, eight number. Okay. And now there's bags here. Who, whose bags are those? You know? So what so, this does. Oh, well, a coat and bag check makes a little more sense. Um, that makes a little more sense to me. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's what the process does. And it's in that automated text to you. And uh, we deployed this to a few venues. Um, a few hotels have used it as well too. And the customers have been raving about uh, the technology process of, of checking, their, checking their items at, at venues now. Yeah, so I'm, I'm seeing two big directions here, you know, <laughs> traditional, traditional bag check, watch out. Yes. Traditional bag check, uh, coat check. Um, so I think we got the good, we, I think we got the sense here. So uh, how should we close this? Uh, well, you should close it by uh, downloading the app on iOS and Android, My, My Bag Check. Um, and definitely any place you go into that, that gives you that traditional, you ask to check something, they give you that traditional piece of ticket that you got to keep up with. Ask them, why don't they have My Bag Check? There you go. So thank you so much for coming on, Micah. Thank you. And uh, I can't wait to see... Uh, how my bag check comes along. Yeah, likewise, likewise. It's gonna be an exciting ride. All right, bye-bye.